Welcome to InspiredStartups.com, uh, continuing our series of interviews with founders uh, in the tech scene. Um, I'm joined this evening by Larry Neumann. Did I get that right? Sounds Hopefully, good. nearly there. Um, I'm really looking forward to, to hearing Larry's story. So um, let's uh, jump right in. So maybe uh, you could tell us a little bit about uh, Moonshot Solutions, mm -hmm. uh, Zilta, and um, also the uh, Dublin Startup Marketing Club. So let's start with Moonshot. Um, it's a classic example that this is a consultancy I run myself uh, when I want to take my uh, tech startup off the ground. So like uh, I came to Dublin from London where just about all the founders I knew, they all had these great ideas. They wanted, you know, they all wanted to get them off the ground, but you know, they, they, they were doing their consultancy. So Moonshot's my consultancy. Zilta is my startup. So that's my baby. Uh, we make age-friendly smartphones. So, Brilliant. you know, it's, it's, it's intended for people like maybe the parents or grandparents who don't really find technology so comfortable. And uh, what was that? Well, yes. Yeah, so, so Startup Marketing Club is my meetup. So on a monthly basis, we cover one topic that's related to marketing uh, from the perspective of early stage startups. So what do you do in terms of social media, AdWords, or, you know, outsourcing, different topics. Okay, great. And where can people find out about that meetup? So it's on meetup.com. So, you know, a star, a Dublin Startup Marketing Club, you'll find it there. It's got a nice pink um, kind of logo. You can't miss it. Okay. Really. So there's a load of things I want to ask you. But the first one is, how does a guy from Finland yeah. uh, end up in Dublin and then over in London and then back in Dublin again? So yeah. maybe you could just start uh, how you came from Finland to Dublin yeah. in the first place. Well, that's a funny, like, it's, it's purely by accident. So... Like, um, when I graduated, my first job was in an online um, games company. You know, back in the day when we were making these flash games, you could play billiards and stuff. So I, I went out and worked for one of those companies. And uh, my first job was the, the summer that Google Analytics launched. Uh, and AdWords was just, just a new thing. They were like, okay, just do something with that. And, uh, you know, for me, it was absolutely fascinating. So I really got into it. And I just realized that you can do so much with it. You can translate ad campaigns into like Turkish or French or Italian, even though you don't know them. So, so I, I really got into the Google kind of advertising culture and, and, uh, and, and I really enjoy that as a, as a job. Um, then I just realized that there's jobs out there at Google. You know, 2006, it was just completely unheard of that someone would be working there. So yeah, I, I applied for a job and it happened to be in Dublin. I didn't, I'd never been to Dublin before and I came here. Um, was here for a few years and then I went to London. Uh, I, I thought it was a great idea to go to London to start an advertising agency with all the knowledge that I built in Google. And it's competitive uh, space. It is a very competitive space yeah. in London. So the, the funny thing was that, um, you know, as an advertising agency, we didn't quite realize how tough it was in London. So we, we you know, after two years, we hardly had any customers in, 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 the, in the UK. But we had loads of customers in, in the Nordics. So what actually happened is another agency came to us and it's like, hey, do you guys want to just do kind of a collaboration partnership acquisition thing? It's like, yeah, okay, fine. So I, I exited that. Okay. Um, uh, <clears throat> and then my, my, my next question is, what do you want to do next? You've run an, uh, your own company. You kind of like doing that. And, but what, what else can you do? And I just went into tech without actually really knowing what. I just wanted to start a tech company. Okay. Um, I don't have a technical background myself, but I just thought it was a really good idea. I like the idea of that you can you can have a product that can really scale up. That's really exciting. Okay, and it's not just tech. You've mm -hmm. gone all the way into hardware. You're yeah. actually developing a phone at the yeah. moment for yeah. uh, for you call them age friendly people. Yeah. yeah. I'm going to coin the term an OAP. That's an old age phone. See, yeah. maybe that might uh, that might work. That's but anyway, that's an aside. That's yeah. just a quick thought. Oh, yeah. um, so uh, I'm very interested in that journey yeah. um, from someone that worked in the ad space, set up their own agency, yeah. and then went into hardware, not even software. Like it's a big jump. Mm. So maybe you could tell us about how you got to this point. Yeah. So uh, last summer I got started. First of all, uh, the, the best and probably the, 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 the best thing that I got started in the beginning is I found one of my old school friends who happened to be a developer and, and he was able to compliment me instead of, you know, okay, let's start a project and start producing, you know, uh, a smartphone solution for our parents. How do we start doing them? And we, we built this interface and, and uh, we, uh, it was all based on Android. So we just released it on Google Play within like a week. And we like, what do you guys think? Just put it on a couple of blogs and saw, try to see what happens. And, um, you know, for the first year, we just kept on giving it away for free. 
just getting a lot of feedback from people. So we, you know, we just got feedback from so many people from around the world. Um, at one point we did a crazy thing that we put um, uh, a live chat function within the app. So anyone in the world, all of our customers could have chatted to us. And we didn't kind of think that through and we got like people chatting to us from Australia in the middle of the night. But in hindsight, that was the best customer experience we could get, like uh, customer development we could get. Because that product really, you know, we got so much insight on what, what our customers, potential customers really want. How do we get into hardware was all because of the customers. So everyone we talked to who'd had the app downloaded for them said Yeah, that, so it's a good point to clarify yeah, for people. Yeah, so there yeah. was originally an app that you yeah. pulled together very quickly. Absolutely. People could download yeah. it from yeah. the um, Google, Google Play, Google, Google Play yeah. Store. Yeah. Um, and then that feedback yeah. Yeah. led to the next step. Entirely. So... Um, so talking to people who'd already downloaded the app or talking to people who might be interested, they all said that, listen, I don't know what Google Play is. Like, you know, I, you know, people download this app for me and it happens to be my son likes this and, you know, I got to try it. That's great. But in actual fact, you know, at, you know, 2014, there's still a lot of people who don't go to app stores to check out new things. Yeah, my parents would be Absolutely. would fall into that bracket. And they would, the last thing they would ever do is put their credit card details on a smartphone. As, I don't know how long it's going to take. I don't know how long that, that that's going to go out there, but it's a real thing. So for us, uh, you know, it, it, you know it, it was the logical step. We need to have a phone. And, um, you know, we started off by having potential licensing partners, you know, maybe doing a deal with a smartphone manufacturer. But, you know, in the end of the day, uh, in China, the way it's going now, it's, it's actually the, the barriers of entry are so low uh, in terms of getting hardware for yourself. You can see it in Kickstarter as well. So a lot of products out there, if they've got a good idea, they can go to crowdfund them and they can just get them sourced. We're kind of doing the same thing, except we're... You know, kind of. Okay, so you guys it. didn't go down the crowdfunding route. No, we didn't. But you, you looked at yeah. it very seriously. Yeah. So the crowdfunding model is absolutely brilliant in the sense that through pre-orders, for example, you can validate that there's actually you, you put a price on something, you you figure out how much it's going to cost you and what the profit margin is, and you just do it. People like it, they'll buy it, and so forth. But Kickstarter as a as a concept, we talked to a few people who'd already run the campaigns, and we looked, at, we did a lot of research into it, and so forth. You know, uh, as a medium, you have to also be careful and think about, is that where you're going to see your potential customers? And for us, the Kickstarter crowd is basically 20 to 30 year old, you know, affluent men who like Arduino and they like, you know, 3D printers. It's not really our audience. So it's much more important for us to find ways to address our customers in the places that they would go. And there's lots of websites out there, for example, for baby boomers or, or seniors, or surfers and so forth, that it's much more relevant that we start addressing them there. Okay, well, and what's the size of that market? I, I mean, mean it's, it's yeah, like, uh, we, just the eight big websites that we were looking at, just reviewing different places to go, there's like four, 45 million monthly active users in just like eight big websites where wow. people, you know, they already offer tech gadgets, right? So either it's like, you know, digital radios or it's like different kinds of, you know, uh, I, I think, uh, you know, big button phones and so forth. Yeah. So it, for us, it's so much more logical to just go down that route, um, even though it's maybe not as, as fashionable as Kickstarter. Okay. Well, it, it go where the go where the audience is, go where your market is, exactly, which yeah. is the, yeah. I suppose, golden rule of, of getting to product market fit. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, and I suppose uh, thinking about that, uh, maybe you have some insights, so you've kind of got a marketing background mm -hmm. and tips. How are you going to reach out to that audience? So um, in terms of reaching out to an audience, um, so our demographic, we actually did this. So um, before the products even ex existed, we were doing display ads uh, through Google AdWords just to see what kind of people like our product and so forth. And because you can demographically target and you can kind of get conversion rates and so forth, then so you can get a good idea of who actually likes your products and where they, 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 they stay in. Like for us, 55 to 65 year olds really liked our, our, our kind of advertising message. And when you actually know that, there's a lot of ways that you can target them through Excellent. paid search or through Facebook or whatever. The big question is, you know, once you identify who you're targeting, you know, uh, with modern kind of, you know, whether it's Facebook or uh, AdWords, you, there's, it's not that yeah. difficult to find them. Yeah. In, so uh, using AdWords as a smoke test. Yeah. So, it, so AdWords, like the, the thing I would always recommend to startups is even before you start, even if you, before you have established what your product is, you should do a bit of advertising just to see if there's a market for it. So like one of the little known things that people don't know about our product is 
we didn't know we wanted to build, build a phone. So in the beginning, we just wanted to see, okay, what kind of digital means would, would, would be better for our parents to, to get in touch? So we came up with a digital photo frame idea. We came up with a third idea that was, I guess it was somehow related to smartphones. I, I almost forgot what it is. And then, you know, it, it was a smartphone app. And we, we, we tested all three of them before they existed, just with a landing page. And the landing page basically said that, you know, this is what we want to build. If you guys like it, give us your email address. And, um, and the launcher, the, the, the kind of friendly front, uh, front page of, of your smartphone, ended up being the thing that people were more, most appealed with. Okay. Um, and I'm just thinking in my head. So you're mentioning um, that this phone was inspired by, I suppose, it, it, your own grandparents or, or who was who yeah. the... Okay. So like uh, both my grandparents, but especially my parents, like uh, okay. my dad's an old, uh, you know, Nokia man. He's, you know, okay. finished phones, proud of all, all the phones he's ever had. Um, but the truth of the matter is the, the, the latest smartphone he had, he just put it away because he was just using it for a couple of days and he was like, okay, I'll give up. And my mom, like she loves her iPad, but it's, it's the same thing. Like when it, when she's actually trying to use smartphones, you know, um, it, it was just a personal thing for her. She just didn't like the, the look and feel of them. So she just wanted something that just kind of a bit okay. more chilled. And, and is one of them called Zilta? Or yeah. where, did the no. name, where did the name come from? That's what I was trying to, yeah. uh, trying the, to work out. Yeah. Was, the, there, was there a connection? There's no connection and the word Zilta doesn't mean anything. Um, it's, it's a bit, it's one of those things that I just don't like calling things. I don't want to, I just like completely new names. Okay. So when my previous company that was called, uh, it, that was an advertising agency, it was called Timgu. And I don't, I, we just came up with a weird name that just, you can kind of pronounce and just go for it. Okay. Own the space. <laughs> Own the space. Yeah, I mean, have yeah, something totally I mean, new. Yeah, and it's, it's uh, for Zilta, it, Zilta kind of means bridge in Finnish. Okay. But it's kind of not exactly that. And it was just a project name that, that stuck for such a long time. And uh, when we started thinking about names, we started thinking about really like, you know, branding names. Like, oh, you know, smartphone for seniors. What could that be? Like simple Android, you know, simple yeah. phone and stuff. Yeah. And it's like that Zilta just stuck. And we yeah. just kept on calling it Zilta and people kept on, okay, that's Zilta. Okay, fine. So. Okay. You know, I think sometimes smart, you know, startups, they, they, they read these books and these blog articles about what's the perfect name and so forth. I think the name should be the last thing you think about. You should just yeah. be working on the product itself. Really interesting. Hey folks, we did all that talking about Zilta and the phone and we never got around to showing it to you. So this is a quick little bit at the end and uh, Larry is going to give us some insights into the phone. Yeah. Um, maybe you could take it away. Yeah. Get us yeah, so so as you see, like uh, really the the, the phone, um, it's all about making things super simple. Um, so there's actually a lot less things that you can do. Large icons, clear options, and when you go to the menu and see things, you know, it, it's it's really in, intended for people who might not have perfect eyesight and so forth, but really have something that they will be familiar with. And again, you know, some people we found that some people really love Facebook, so you can like customize it a bit and add Facebook there on the home screen. You know, it's like every one of us is a bit different, and, and then that's what we're kind of all about figuring out what is the perfect phone for each 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 of our um, customers. Target audience is a bit older, uh, you know, fifty five to sixty five year olds and above, and so forth. Now, in terms of phone, this is like uh, it's it's uh, you know it, it's running. Uh, the latest version of Android, uh, and it's it's really, um, you know, in on par with something like a Nexus Four, um, okay. In terms of hardware specs, and how are you able to um, get them at an affordable okay. price? Yeah. So uh, fundamentally, like um, the 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 chipsets and so forth we've chosen are, are come from a Taiwanese manufacturer that's really specializing in low end phones. So we think there's going to be a lot more phones being sold at lower prices, and they not might not be run by the same American you know big tech companies out there. Um, and uh, the hardware we've been testing so far it looks great, and um, you know really uh, this is the kind of the next big thing we think. Uh, how are the next billion phones going to be produced? It's going to be pr produced by you know sensibly priced, you know Chinese or Taiwanese companies. Okay, excellent. And do you want to give people watching maybe a quick yeah. spin around of the phone? 
Yeah. Maybe you can show them the back and show yeah. them. So it actually has a camera on it. Yeah. So the, the camera so it's, as it's well. Not, it's not, it, it yeah. has a lot of the features. Yeah. Like a Nexus 4 is yeah. a decent enough phone. Actually, so. so yeah, so so it's got an eight megapixel camera in the back. It's got a two megapixel camera in the front. Uh, and in terms of GPS, it has that. FM radio was actually like, funnily enough, it was like the one feature people really wanted. So, we, you know, it does have FM radio. And uh, in terms of, uh, you know, insides, the, I think the four gigabytes of uh, RAM and four, uh, one gigabyte of ROM, that was the kind of, um, you know, 1.3 gigahertz processor that's basically speedy enough that it's going to run any of the apps you want but it's not going to cost you the moon, basically. Okay, and you mentioned that you went through kind of a process of yeah. getting a lot of feedback when you released yeah. the initial app yeah. to the yeah. Google Play Store. Yeah. Did any things you learned from that feed directly into the, yeah. uh, the, the phone itself? I mean, totally. Like, in the beginning, like, we assume things like, okay, people really want to get their music from their phone and so forth. So one of the, the big apps on the, you know, in the very beginning of the, uh, the, 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 our first version of the app um, was a big music button. No one really pressed it. And then we figured out that, okay, so we started asking people what would they really want. And people really want SMS. Um, you might think that people are using WhatsApp or they're using Hangouts and so forth, but in our target demographics, people really want SMS. So we've, we're incorporating an SMS function there that should be hopefully easy enough to use and people feel comfortable with. Okay, great. Okay. And uh, I suppose taking it back a step, um, how do you find being... A Finnish guy in Dublin. Um, how have you found? Because one of the things that yeah. seems to be happening a lot now, yeah. a lot of people are moving to <coughs> Dublin yeah. and it's getting a rep as a tech hub. Yeah. Yeah. Um, do you think that's deserved? Do you, yeah. do you see that on the ground? Well, I, I think um, I think Ireland, especially Dublin, has got so much going for it. Uh, so looking at it from the outside, I think it's, it is a tech hub. It's, when you think about the, the fact that there's like, uh, I think it's like 5,000 people, Google, Facebook, those big companies in, in the docks area, or the Grand Canal docks. Uh, Silicon Row, I think Silicon is what they call Row. it now. That's what they're uh, you think about, it. Exactly. And you think about why are all the American companies coming here? You know, okay, partly it's tax, but partly it's because there's a lot of good talent. And if you want to start an international operation, that's where you come. So, like, um, so for me, it, it already is. It's a massive global tech hub and I don't think American or, or international companies have a choice when they want to start up a European office. They need to come okay. here. So what it's logical that if you have a startup, early stage startup, and you actually get to grow it to this phase where it can internationalize, you know, you shouldn't need to look to London or somewhere. Like London's just an expensive, really expensive uh, you know, hub in its own. How so, would you compare? Now we're not trying to get yeah. scoring or one upmanship yeah. on London here. Yeah. But how would you compare? I'm always fascinated by yeah. this. Some people are really adamant that yeah. London is 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 a, an emerging tech hub. Other yeah. people say Dublin's got quite a bit going yeah. for it. How would you score the two of them against each other? The well, in my view, I think everyone has to go to London. They have to go for certain events, or they have to go potentially to meet people there and so forth. That's just a, a fact of life. That that's where you go, and and you, you maybe you establish yourself through investors and so forth. But in terms of running a startup, I can't name that case. Spotify, it started with lots of money and, you know, all the other big companies that I know are London based, like they, they're big, they were big before they kind of established in London. Um, in terms of running an early stage company, um, they have some fantastic networking opportunities like um, Campus London in Shoreditch, you know, run by Google and it's like big community. But trying to build a team, trying to get you, you know, product off the ground, it's not so easy in, in such a place. And mm -hmm. I think uh, a lot of early stage companies in Dublin uh, should look at what they have good for you. So so rent here, per, for both for, uh, you know, yourself and for your office uh, is so much cheaper than London. Living here is so much cheaper. And, and the fact that you can be in a qu slightly quieter place and actually just can focus on doing uh, and, and building a team around you, it, 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 there's a lot of things going for you. And, and how do you find the community? Yeah. Here, it, does it match up with with what I've been told? Where yeah. it's it's a little bit smaller and closer yeah. knit in Dublin, yeah. and London, it's a bit spread out, yeah. and it's kind of yeah. you might see somebody not see them again for yeah. years, or you know yeah. that, that that sort of experience. Exactly. So in 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 Dublin, the the funny thing is that the community seems to be spread spread out geographically. So you know you've got people over at the digital hub, and then you've got the people over at uh, you know the, the again the the Grand Canals, Silicon, whatever yeah. you call it, and then you've got the Liffey Trust building, you know, all over the place. Yeah. Um, but there's a few events that people always go to and you do kind of, once you know people, you know, okay, this is our community. Yeah. Whereas in London, like, 
everything is extremely central in shortage. So, you know, like, yes, there's companies outside of it, but everyone ends up going to certain, you know, just about every night to, to one or two places there. But you almost never really get the, the close connections with people. Yeah. So you will know people by face, you'll know what they do, but you, you won't really build that, you know, understanding of, okay, what these guys are doing and how you can actually help each other. Um, now, I'm not going to say that you don't end up helping each other in London. I'm just saying that it's more natural to do it here because you're okay. all kind of in the same position. Okay, really interesting. Mm. Uh, jumping forward, something that I've been fascinated with is the emergence of the Internet of Things. Mm. And um, if you peeled back the years, if you went even back three years mm. ago, uh, things were very heavily, you know, st st startups were web-based, they were software-based. Yeah. Yeah. Hardware was a big, it was, it was kind of a, yeah. it was, it was something that was too big to, yeah. to, to, to bite off. But with the Internet of Things, with what mm. you're doing, there's yeah. been a real revolution. And, and I'm increasingly mm. hearing of people mm. that are um, setting up hardware startups. Yeah. And we'll come back to the yeah. NDRC yeah. in a moment because there's a number of companies coming yeah. out of there. Um, how, for people that are at home and are watching mm. this and are thinking, do you know what, I can think of a really good hardware or mm. physical product I'd like mm. to produce. Um, what, what lessons would you have for them? I think the interesting thing is, uh, like, like you already said, that um, the, the the kind of barriers to entry in hardware have have just about collapsed completely. Like, um, there's the the emergence of China and specifically Shenzhen as the the kind of the the one factory for all the electronics that you can ever imagine um, means means that. Um, with the amount of scale that they can and they produce there, it means that you can almost you can get you know components extremely cheap. But then the real you know challenging thing is to come up with enough imagination to figure out what can you do with them. So like for example a Raspberry Pi, even you know an Arduino and so forth, these kind of devices are really cheap. The the real magic comes from coming up with a reason why you know you can put it into a teddy bear or something or like intelligent light switch. Um, and um, because we've reached a stage where Internet of Things or just in hardware, there's so many people do, doing it and they, you know, through the Internet you can go get quotes from China and so forth. It, it does mean that the factories are much more open to doing this customization. That, okay, we can start off doing a small batch of orders specifically for you guys, but who knows where that's going to grow. So it's actually not so difficult to go get offers you know, from China. And if, you, if you're just thinking about, oh, how much would it cost for me to build this? Kind of product, like I've got this idea and so forth. Getting the prices fig figured out is not so complicated. The the big challenge is again like actually coming up with a product idea itself that people want to buy. So for that, the real challenge is you know put it on Kickstarter, you know put it on your website and see what people think. If they pay for it, you can build it. Okay. For most people, and I would include myself in this, the thought of going to China, hmm. sourcing a product. Yeah. Have you been over or have you done it all remotely? I've done it all remotely. Okay. But I have learned a lot. Like, I, but that's what's got, that was yeah. my next question was, <laughs> yeah. there must be a lot of learning because culturally yeah. Yeah. Um, and, yeah. and how you actually yeah. get them yeah. you know, to send you yeah. trials of the product, how you communicate yeah. it. How, how was that whole process managed? It was hilarious. So, um, like, okay, I actually, I, when I was a kid, I, I did spend a, a couple of years, I, I lived in Hong Kong, so I know a lot of the culture. Okay, elements. right, so that's a nice that little really bit of us. an advantage. So I already kind of insight. knew how you'd supposed to kind of deal with kind of asking for offers and so forth, but the fundamental fact is if you go ask 10 factories for 10 offers in China and you don't really know what you're doing, you go to Alibaba or somewhere and you're like, oh, this one looks like a credible one you are probably going to get pretty badly screwed. Okay, because um, I've heard of people that have done something yeah, similar totally. and have got really yeah. badly yeah. burnt from yeah. the experience. So for example, like, you know, I don't know, I, I can say this, but, uh, you know, um, we ordered like test devices for these smartphones that were like, okay, you know, let's buy this one. This one looks pretty good. This one's, you know, it's got the spy right specs in it. And then one of the devices, it got stuck in the customs. And it's like, why did it get stuck in customs? Oh, because it's actually a knockoff of some, some device we've never heard of. So these Chinese factories, you have to be really careful with them because they might be selling, you know, products to you and claim they're legit, but you have the responsibility. Okay, all right. So it's it's almost yeah. like a counterfeiting yeah, kind of exactly. issue. Yeah, exactly. And it's like, wait, we were just ordering a sample. We have no idea what these guys are because okay. you don't know. There's okay. there's anyone can have a website. Anyone can say that they're you know you can buy phones from them and so forth. Okay. So the the, the magic thing that that now we've got set up with is is go through people who've done it before, go through people who are doing, you know, 
uh, importing supply okay. chain. Okay. So do you have so um, like kind of an intermediary? Yeah. yeah. Someone yeah. that's yeah. that's Irish or yeah. somebody that's yeah. European. So we've got and you one, work with we've them. We've got one in Ireland as well. But in the same time, when you're getting quotes, you need to go to 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 get them in different places. So we've got one in Finland and we've got one in Ireland. And you know, if someone's been doing this for eight years, just latch on to that like expertise because. Uh, especially in China, it's a relationship game. Okay. So if you go there and you ask for something, and you'll get an offer, no doubt. Okay. But you'll, if they don't know you, if they've never, never talked to you, the, the, the cultural thing is that you know that's a one-off thing. Okay. Whereas if you build a relationship, you say, okay, I, and this is my you know associate who's asking for the offer and so forth. You know, people treat you differently. So, so that's that's a logical thing that you know we kind of learned uh, while we're doing it. But you know, it's a relationship game. So price is not the only factor to go after in China. You have to know people, and you have to be able to double check what are the orders they've done before, have they delivered, what's the return rate. You know, you really do your due, due diligence uh, and make sure that you know it's it's not a one-off for anyone. Okay, so that segues into my next question, yeah. which was um, outsourcing. Yeah. So to a degree, what you're talking yeah. about there is bringing in somebody and outsourcing a component yeah. Yeah. for them to look after. Yeah. And um, it's a very interesting model. A lot of people are trying it now. A lot yeah. of people are making a mess of it. Yeah. Um, it requires quite a bit of skill to do the yeah. outsourcing thing correctly. Yeah. Um, and from the brief chat we've had before, yeah. you're giving me some insight yeah. uh, into that space. So maybe tell us about your own experience yeah. with outsourcing. I think that, you know, another thing that in a global world where you can just kind of source talent or, or technology anywhere, so outsourcing is, is also like the barriers of asking for someone around the world with a bit of expertise to help you out or, or be a part of a team. There's nothing there stopping you. And so, how would you go about reaching yeah. out to these people? So, so, for example, so if you go to websites like freelancer.com, Odesk, Elon's, you okay. know, kind of freelancer you know, marketplace. Freelancer market. That's actually when, when I got started with a tech company, again, I, I was not the technical co founder. I really started with an idea and I was like, okay, fine, I'll hire a team. You know, okay. I've got a budget, I'll hire a team. And I, I started project managing my, in myself and, and I had a really good idea of, of what was going on and so forth. And, and my, actually, I can tell you, my, my team was in the Philippines and lovely people. We were getting so much done and like we had, you know, regular checkups and we, I could talk to the, you know, the different guys on the team, the front end, back end and so forth. And then like a month and a half later, we just got into it that, okay, so actually, you know, I wasn't really communicating very well what the final product is and they were not really delivering very well the the actual specifics of it mm. so so it was a mutual thing that, that you know they were always willing to take money from me to, to continue doing this project but actually it turns out they weren't really the right team to do it okay and for cultural reasons they were also not really able to say that's the that's the classic experience yeah. people have with outsourcing yeah. where they exactly. kind of offshore work yeah. um, yeah. as part of a project or, yeah. or part of something they're doing yeah. and then they find out that those cultural yeah. communication yeah. issues exactly um, come to the fore only too late though yeah. only when you're and i hear it so many times and it's just not like you know it, it, it's it's the, one of the big things so if, if you are considering outsourcing as an option to, to to build your mvp and so forth bring in someone you trust on the technical side to actually oversee it even if you have to pay like a friend of yours or someone you trust to, to kind of spend a couple hours doing the, the sourcing and so forth. Because now in our team, we still do outsourcing. We just, my technical co-founder gets involved and we're like, we're very careful. And, and there's other things you can do as well. Like um, one of the favorite tactics we have now is that when we have something to do, uh, instead of hiring someone to do a big gig for us, we hire a lot of people to do small gigs just to kind of see who can do it, right? And you know, by giving someone a small gig, you, you narrow down, first of all, the people who bullshit completely. So if someone says they're a PHP developer and it turns out they don't even know what it means, you know, you, you, they, don't, they don't give you the, the, the small kind of sample order. But then, you know, over time, again, like um, once, w once you do get the right people, then okay, fine, you can, you can give them more responsibility and you can do re repeat orders. So it's the old story of building yeah. the relationship. Exactly, yeah. And you have to give yeah. them maybe a small little bit yeah. of work, exactly. see how that's done a bit yeah. more, yeah, yeah. and then yeah. build that trust. Yeah. And they trust you and you trust yeah. them, and then you can, yeah. you can take it forward. And to be honest, my, my, my favorite website to do is fiverr.com where you just pay a fiver for someone to do some really Some simple. great stuff, some great gigs yeah. up, up on Fiverr. And um, so the way we do it is like, we order pretty much the same thing from three different guys, we check it out, and if there's something you know there, then we've ended up repeat buying from them and so forth. So I think for us, it's, it's, it's slightly more inefficient, but the biggest waste of time for you will be 
chasing down people who are not doing their jobs. Yeah. So for in that sense, it's very efficient for us. Yeah. So with Zilta, you have a pre-order model mm-hmm. in place, which yeah. is brilliant because it's it's validating your mm-hmm. product. Yeah. Um, and maybe uh, you mentioned you're going to be reaching out to mm. baby boomers and yeah. you've identified websites. Yeah. Do you have some tips for people that are looking to go down, not the Kickstarter model, um, but people that are looking at pre-ordering? Mm. What, what could they do and I suppose what can they learn from what you've done? I think the, in, in terms of pre-orders, I think the, these days, you know, you can open up a shop, Shopify uh, website and you, you, you start pay, taking payments through Stripe, for example. Those are two websites. Uh, you know, I'd recommend that, you know, opening up e-commerce possibilities is, is not that difficult these days. So as soon as you can actually put a price uh, on, your, on, your, on your product, do it. Um, you know, and um, even before you do that, like, just go ask people. Go ask them, like, it's a tough question to ask, but the, the sooner you can go and recognize in your startup that, you know, is this something people would pay for? Yeah. How much would they pay for it? Would they pay more than the company? Yeah. Those are the questions you Customer need to ask so early, yeah. yeah. And, um, and I think pre-orders is, is a great example because, again, you know, um, we really are in control of the situation. Um, you know, um, we know how many we need to, to get sold. We know how much they're going to cost and we know what our profit margins are. And that, that's something that we can build upon the rest of the startup around it. Okay. Right? So, and that's also a good idea because, you know, let's say you're looking for investment. You know, until you actually have sold products, which is a lot of startups I've talked to, they're still kind of working on their idea. You know, investors are going to be very, you know, cautious about anything that's not selling. Yeah. But if you can even sell a small number of pre-orders, then that's yeah. brilliant. Yeah. It's validation. Yeah, it's totally you know, validation. It's showing that yeah. you've gone from one part yeah. all the way through the, the, the yeah. process and exactly. the, the chain. Yeah. Um, and speaking of investment, are you guys looking at that space? Yeah, is, is that something that you have on your roadmap? Yeah, we, we, we're going to start an investment round this summer and I think we're going to be in the same position as everyone else that, you know, we have a product we really like. We're going to start pre-orders and see if there's validation there and that's really going to guide our, our potential valuation and interest in our product. Uh, I think it's, it, realistically, it's, it's something that, it, it's a, you know, something that whether you're in London or you're here, it's going to take a few months and that's, that's what, something we're aware of. But... But it's something that, yeah, we're, we're looking just as everyone else that, you know, our ambitions are to grow considerably. Okay, great. Yeah. Um, and then changing gears slightly, the Dublin Startup Marketing Club. Yeah. Maybe tell us about when's the next one on? So the next one's on the 3rd of June. Uh, and do we know what the topic yeah. is? The topic's going to be crowdfunding. Okay, so it's yeah. tapping into what we were talking exactly. about earlier. Yeah. Okay, good stuff. So, so when is it a good time to, to, to go out and do a crowdfunding campaign? And, and what are the kind of things? And you know, what are the processes? So we've actually gone through it. We, we went through 90% of, of what you need to do to launch a crowdfunding campaign. And then we decided not to. Okay. So uh, I'm, I'm say that took a bit of discipline. Yeah, To not totally. push the button. Yeah. But, but sometimes it's the best thing you can do and like every time you do something like that you, you can you let's say you launch a website or you do a piece of market research and so forth and you think that okay was that worth my time every time you can do something that you know clarifies what your value proposition is and gets you closer to the, the customers it's yeah. better so so that meetup is, is all going to be about you know when is it the right time to do crowdfunding and what are the best techniques we've talked to loads of people who've done crowdfunding campaigns what are the real tactics that you need to do to, to succeed so um, the space you're in is really interesting and where do you see it um, it evolving so like, where's the space going to go yeah. um, I suppose from a couple of things yeah. that the area you're in with, yeah. the, with the phones and what you're going to do yeah. you mentioned investment but how you're yeah. going to grow it yeah. but then also how is the overall yeah. area going to evolve so this year a billion smartphones are going to ship like around the world so whatever you do in terms of mobile technologies if whether it's an app or if it's a piece of hardware and so forth it's it's a massively growing market i don't think we've even seen the beginning of where, where it's going to end up um for us we think that uh the next couple of years we're going to be selling our, our smartphones we know our customer market and we know we the amount of sales we need to get to to, to start growing um our major competitor has 24 million in, in quarterly sales so like there's a big opportunity to you know eat, eat some of their dinner yeah, exactly yeah. Um, but you know the future is bright for anyone in mobile right now and I think you know most of the great ideas haven't been invented yet okay and you're are you tempted to move into wearable tech or anything like that down the line or is that just oh, way too far absolutely actually it's not so far at all so 
you know, for example, um, you know, Google Gears, like um, Google Google Smart Watches, yeah. uh, they run on Android as well. So porting some of the things we've already learned is not that, you know, yeah. uh, distant. Um, I think what I would question is Google Glass, for example. It's been on the hold for the last couple of years, so that that's probably not I would where I would put, place my bets, even okay. with even with the smart watches. What you have to be careful about is look at how many sales that you've had. So. You know, yeah. whether it's that in market tens of is millions, still, it's still nascent, in its infancy. So, yeah. so, and for us, our market is smartphones for who are people who are not really the early, you know, uh, tech enthusiasts. So there's going to be a huge market out there for people who are, you know, maybe not reading TechCrunch every day. Okay, yeah. really interesting. Um, and you touched upon accelerators there. Um, yeah. And you mentioned you uh, just going through an accelerator at the moment. Yeah. How have you found that experience? Yeah. And people, particularly in the hardware space, yeah. So a lot of people go to accelerators with kind of a web or software idea um, mm. and it's kind of a well-trodden yeah. path, but yeah. going to accelerators with a hardware product, yeah. how, how was that? I think the, 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 we went to, uh, so we're in the NDRC launchpad right now, just finishing off and then we went there with a very clear problem. We didn't have yeah. a business plan, really. We, okay. We'd been building a product that we were really passionate about, talking to customers and so forth, but when it actually came to making money out of it, that was kind of something that we just kept on delaying. So I think the best part of accelerators is that it, if you have a focused problem that you really need solving, you know, three months of dedication, advisors and mentors will, will help you get through that, yeah. that path. It's like chipping yeah. the block of marble chipping, into exactly. something that you can actually recognize. Exactly, yeah. Yeah. And uh, for us, it's been absolutely brilliant. I think the one thing that uh, word of caution there is that sometimes... Um, you might be too hasty to try to pivot. So if someone gives you a bit of advice, you might be too enthusiastic. Yes, I'll always be pivoting, isn't exactly, it? Exactly, yeah. There's definitely, yeah. Um, uh, from our own experience and yeah. people I've spoken to over the yeah. years, um, you, you can only pivot so much until you go, well, actually, hang on, I believe in what I'm yeah. doing and I believe in who yeah. I am and what we're at. Yeah. Um, and I think that becomes an important learning exactly. out of stuff. So as a startup going through an accelerator, the valuable point is at some point you need to go back and say, no, actually, this is our product. This is what we believe in. And I think they sometimes the advisors they might even push your, your check check where that balance is, and once they actually know that this is what you're comfortable doing, this is your business plan and so forth, you know they back you all the way. But uh, you, you know you really have to set those barriers yourself. You need to at some point take control because it is your business, and no accelerator is really going to get you. That's just you know three months experience, and then you you know after that, 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 that that's going to be the baby you're going to hopefully be building for a couple of years. Right? Yeah, yeah. Okay, that was really good. Um, so uh, just to, I suppose, to wrap up, maybe you could tell people where we can find out about um, uh, Moon uh, Shot Solutions, yeah. which we didn't really touch on, actually. Yeah. We might actually just give a, yeah. a little bit of an intro yeah. to Moon Shot Solutions. Yeah. Maybe you can, can so, give us some So some Moon background. Shot Solutions is my consultancy, and, and it's, it's really, it's the kind of thing that if you're doing a startup now, if you have an idea, the worst thing you can do is just quit your job and start just doing, you know, Trying to building a startup without any revenues, so like anyone thinking about that, if you have some skills, like for for me, it was all about paper pay per click advertising. Okay, that's your time you in know, Google, that's, obviously, that's and that's what you Google learned from and them. My, that's my background. So, um, as a founder, you can expect that you know for cash flow, start a consultancy. So, Moonshot's been my consultancy. The name came from an article that uh, Larry Page, the founder of Google. Um, uh, wrote uh, challenging people to reach for the moon and think think big. Okay. So uh, it, it's kind of a name. The name reminds John me John F. Kennedy that. style think stuff big. when he exactly, was put a man yeah. on the moon. Okay, put a man yes. on the moon. Exactly. Um, so you know, if you're there thinking about an idea you have, like the worst thing you can do is just quit your day job and start doing it. Just you know, make sure that you can have your cash flow personally and so forth. So you, you, the last thing you want to worry about is do you have a roof over your head? Yeah. Um, so moonshot is that. You know, in terms of where you can you, you can find more information, azilta.co is our website where okay. we'll soon start taking pre-orders for the age-friendly phone. Okay. And on Meetup. So everybody, get your grandparents. Exactly. Get them online and get them signed yeah. up. Right in time for Christmas. And uh, and um, on Meetup.com, the startup marketing club. Um, you know, we've had some really good uh, group coming with with a lot of interesting discussions. So. Um, after the summer holidays, we'll be thinking about new topics. So if people have ideas, just come around and we'll, we'll think about them. Okay, great. Um, and then moonstrokesolutions dot dot co dot co. Okay, excellent. So that wraps up our uh, talk here with InspiredStartups.com. Um, 
hopefully you'll join us again for our uh, next uh, Founders Talk. Looking forward to seeing you then. Bye-bye.